Hi, my name is Ron Lammers. I'm code enforcement officer for the city of Riverview. Uh, I've been here about 11 years now and um, I've been asked to go over some of the details involving code enforcement, who we are and what we do and how we go about our job as well as what some of the responsibilities of our job are. Uh, I understand that there is a prepared list of some questions that uh, oftentimes come up and uh, at this point in time I'm prepared to go ahead and try to address some of those concerns. Can you explain the code enforcement job in detail? Basically um, what we do uh, here in code enforcement is that we are responsible for uh, enforcement of, of all the codes of ordinances involving property, property maintenance, um, zoning ordinances, uh, building codes, uh, housing codes, rental ordinance, those types of things. So it's a multitude of, of ordinances that we're responsible for enforcing. Generally the police department doesn't get involved in uh, property related codes, that's more for code enforcement. What are some of the challenges of this job? I would say um, probably the challenges, at least during my tenure here, is that uh, in informing people of the ordinances that we have. Uh, there's so many different ordinances that involve many different things, particularly regarding property. And oftentimes what happens is property owners uh, get a little concerned when we show up at the door, we're either there or something that we've observed or maybe on a complaint, and then instructing the property owner or occupant regarding violations on the property that, that they then have to correct. So are there state laws to follow or city codes? They're, they're actually both. Um, most of the ordinances though that we enforce here are, are generally from the code of ordinances uh, those ordinances are online. They can be found on our website uh, as well as the zoning ordinances. But you're not going to find uh, the state codes on there. So if you give a violation or a warning, what is the length of time do you give them to correct it? It's going to depend on the severity of the, uh, of the violation and the magnitude. Um, uh, generally, um, if it's something related to uh, saying maybe RV parking or something, uh, typically that length of time on that is generally 72 hours, so it's not going to be much longer than that. But it, it just depends on the severity of the, of the ordinance violation. So there's fees for the violations, and if there are, how much are they? The only time that you're going to get into any type of fee that would be associated with a violation is if there is a citation that is issued. Generally what we do is, um, uh, in most all cases, we will issue a written violation notice of some type uh, instructing the uh, responsible party regarding the violation. And if they're given a period of time to correct that. Uh, if they have questions or something concerning the, the violation notice, uh, there's a number on there where they can reach out to us and give us a call and we call back and then we'll explain in detail what what the violation is or how they can go about curing the violation. Uh, how many code enforcement officers are there with the city? Currently we have four part-time code enforcement officers um, and we patrol um, seven days a week at varying times of the day and as well as into the evening hours. Okay. Uh, code enforcement, does it, it falls under what department and where did it originate from? Well, code enforcement originated in a police department uh, and back many years ago and actually just prior to my starting it was actually part of the police department. Uh, subsequently it was moved to community development department where it's been for probably about the last 12 years and uh, it's actually a better working relationship because a lot of the the things that we do in code enforcement has to do with building and zoning so it's you know right here in the same department so it, it works out real well. We also have the support and backing from the police department uh, if it's you know things involving vehicles and things of that nature where we can you know we work with them to get those types of things corrected. Um, how does one person like file a complaint? 
There are a number of ways of filing a complaint. Uh, probably the simplest way is to pick up the telephone and give us a call. Um, 734-281-4249 is, uh, is my, my number here. And uh, uh, you can call in and leave the information regarding you know, where a com complaint or a concern that you have is and we'll check into it. And does the complainer, are they required to identify themselves? Not, not in all cases. Uh, if you're just calling regarding a general complaint of some type, uh, we can go out and check on that and uh, take the appropriate action if, if anything is required. Okay. What happens if you get a notice or a violation and you don't understand it? As I said earlier, the best thing to do is if you get a notice, don't ignore it because then what ends up happening is we end up going to the next step. In some cases, it may be issuing a second notice uh, or going directly to a citation. If we issue a citation, then that can only be resolved through the court. We don't have the ability to, um, to wipe a citation out once it's been issued. All those are issued electronically now, and once it's issued, then it's a matter to be dealt with through the court. So if you get a violation notice, give us a call. We can work through it if you need more time on something depending on situations in the household, uh, maybe some limitations due to your physical ability or something like that, give us a call, we can work with you. But if we don't hear from you, then what ends up happening is that we end up taking a little more drastic enforcement action, which like I said, could include uh, issuance of citations or court action. Are you allowed to open um, or operate a business out of your home? And if you are, do you need to get a business license? Depending on the type of business that you're trying to, uh, to operate out of your home, um, there are a number of um, home-based occupations that you can run out of your home. In all cases, though, they are required to have a business license that's issued through the city clerk. Um, I would suggest that if you are in the process of or are running a business out of your house and you're not licensed, check with the city clerk's office or give code enforcement a call and we can tell you what your next steps are on those. But there are a number of license um, uh, requirements that would not meet the home-based occupation. For example, like if you're running a um, construction business where you have a multitude of equipment, contractors or employees coming and going, or like landscaping businesses where you have equipment, trucks, trailers, employees, things of that nature, those are not permitted in residential districts and would be prohibited. But there are some cases and in, in situations like that, and I know we do have some in town uh, where we have issued a provisional license uh, based on uh, them actually just doing maybe book work or paperwork from, from their home and not keeping equipment there and distracting or causing problems in the neighborhood. Are you allowed to store either vehicles, boats, RVs, campers, four-wheelers on your property? You are allowed to store those types of um, uh, recreational equipment and vehicles on your property. Uh, depends on where, where you're keeping them at or where you're storing them at. Uh, under our ordinances, um, RVs and trailers, of uh, things of that nature, are permitted in your driveway for a period of 72 hours or on the street for a period of 72 hours. Um, oftentimes we get people that that will call and think that well if I keep my trailer in the driveway for 72 hours now I can put it on the street for 72 hours. That's not the case. It's a total of 72 accumulative hours uh, either on the street or in the driveway. Uh, if you call us and there's some extenuating circumstances because they're like right now this time of the year spring and in the fall is when we get a lot of homeowners that bring their RVs in to get them ready for the season or they're bringing them back to winterize them, get them ready for winter. In those types of situations, we are a little more lenient because we understand that. Uh, but there are also, you know, circumstances where they're doing some kind of a repair or something. They need a little more time, more than 72 hours. And if you give us a call, uh, we'll generally work with you on that. But give us a call if that's the case. Since spring is coming, can you tell us a little bit about the grass and the weeds and is that there are violations for if it gets too long? 
Grass and, and weeds is one of the things during the summer months and the grass growing season that keeps us extremely busy. Um, we do have a uh, grass and weed ordinance uh, that pertains not only to occupied properties but vacant properties as well. Uh, and we, we pay a lot of attention to that to, you know, to keep the neighborhoods looking good. Uh, in the residential district, the maximum height for grass is eight inches. Um, Non-developed properties, vacant land, uh, undeveloped is, is 10 inches. But uh, in the residential neighborhoods and you know, other business places and so forth, it's eight inches. Are you allowed to blow your leaves out into the street or rake them into the street? City of Riverview does not have uh, a program that allows residents to do that like some of the other surrounding communities. Um, so what we ask is that uh, you know you bag your leaves, you rake the leaves up, and you set them out for collection during designated times. Uh, but no, grass clippings, leaves, and things of that nature, is do not put them into the street because then what ends up happening is they get into the sewer system and it creates other problems. So. No, that is, that's a, that's a definite no. Is there any type of violation for like shoveling your snow? There's a couple different things involving snow. Uh, we have ordinance that says, you know, within a period of time after the uh, snow flies, so to speak, and under the ordinance requirements, it's uh, 24 hours. And, and what we use as a gauge there is from 24 hours begins when the snow stops. So going forward 24 hours, you need to have your sidewalks shoveled and clear of snow and ice uh, within that period afterwards. Um, there's also another ordinance pertains to blowing and shoveling snow into the streets, which is prohibited. What about trash? Like say I'm renovating my house and I have a bunch of garbage. Can I just put it out on the curb for trash day? It's going to depend on the type and the amount of trash mm -hmm. that, that you're talking about. Um, our contractors that, that pick up the trash here in the city, uh, they will not pick up any more than what's called 10 bushels. Uh, and again, depending on the type of trash that you're setting out, you may want to contact the uh, DPW for a special pickup. Uh, our special pickups are done twice a month uh, on the second uh, and fourth Thursday of each month. It's free to residents, uh, so you would have to call the DPW and arrange that. And if you fail to do that and you set your stuff out and they haven't been notified, then there's technically a violation. The other option that you have is uh, as a resident of Riverview, we have the landfill right here. So you have the opportunity, if you have the means to do so, you can take your debris and, and take it to the landfill. You can contact them for that and they can give you more specifics on it. But that's another option that's available to the residents. So if I'm scheduling a special pickup, how far in advance can I put the trash out on my curb? Technically, again, you get into the technicalities of that. Uh, even for a special pickup, it's 5 p.m. the night before, so no sooner than 5 p.m. the night before the normal collection time, and that also pertains to regular trash. So hopefully um, that has answered some of your questions. I know that uh, we, we get a lot of calls and concerns from people about various ordinances and what's covered and what's not covered. Now, the only thing that I can tell you, and again, going back to what some of the uh, things of this job entail and, and challenges uh, would be to actually learn the ordinances, uh, what applies and what doesn't apply. There are certain situations regarding private property or, or structures and so forth where uh, some ordinances don't apply to that. So you have to know what the ordinances are to fit a particular situation especially if it's something that may possibly end up where citations are issued or a court matter. We have to make sure that the ordinances that we're writing fit the violation. But again, the, the, uh, one of the things that I've learned in, in being here and I often say is that we can just arbitrarily issue violation notices, but the one thing that I've learned is that the situations beyond that doorway are different for everybody. I mean, I've run into situations where they recently lost a family member or the person is disabled 
or maybe it's a vacant home and the person is in assisted living or something now. So again, and I say that because the situation is different for every home. So generically and will generally will always issue a violation notice and hopefully that will generate some type of communication between code enforcement, the occupant or homeowner or a responsible party so that then we know how to proceed forward to get those matters corrected. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And if you have any questions, please feel free to call us. Again, that's 734-281-4249. Thank you and have a great day.